Oh my Emperor, do we finally live in a world where the Sisters of Battle and its evolution to the Adeptus Sororitas stands on its own two feet? and proclaims to anyone that will listen that we hath arrived and you shall know godless amounts of fear. I'm your narrator Benji and this is the review stroke primer stroke 101 stroke everything you bleeding well need to know about the new Adepta Sororitas Codex. What's in there, why you should care and how you can disseminate the words contained therein to bite sized chunks of manageable information. So who are the Adeptus Sororitas? Put simply, they're an all-female militant arm of the Adeptus Ministorum, aka the Church of the Imperium. Their fundamental goal is that of witch hunters. They function as the oh shit button of the Ordo Hereticus, the we hate psychers and witches sect of the Imperial Inquisition. The bonkers reason that they're all female is because a decree was passed down that the church should have no men at arms. So, sneaky buggers that the Ecclesiarchy are, they went full loophole with the rules. On the battlefield, they have rare access, considering that they're regular humans, to technology usually reserved for the Adeptus Astartes, such as power armour and bolt guns. What that translates to is a statline equivalent that has comparatively low toughness, but high armour saves. They're somewhat unusual with their lack of psychers, but this is offset with some potent army-wide abilities, prayers and acts of faith. They do still have some limitations with long-range weaponry, but pack a real punch in short and medium range. So whilst that is the sisterhood in a nutshell, I did say at the top we're here to talk about the Codex. You know, the book with all the good stuff in. Okay, so as is common in 9th edition, we start off with detachment abilities. And as with a number of Imperium armies, this is where it lays out that a legal detachment is one that includes only Adeptus Sororitas units, except of course those with the Cult Imperialis keyword, which can be found pretty much exclusively in this book and effectively represents those that aren't Sisters of Battle but are in here anyway. You've also got Ages of Imperium and Unaligned that are welcome at the All Girls Party. You'll see the glorious news that all troop units have the Objective Secured ability, accompanied by the not so glorious news that there's only one troop unit choice, that being the Ubiquitous Battle Sisters Squad. Now you can tell you're a bit of a patchwork army when this fact comes to pass. But rest assured, this is the best shape the army has ever found itself in, so let's keep the negativity to a minimum. The Decree Passive, sorry, it's like scratching an itch, sees you maxing out with only one Canoness and one Missionary per detachment, and restricting you to a number of Cult Imperialis Priesty Boys less than or equal to the number of Sororitas characters making sure they know who's boss. We then arrive in Fun Town where we talk about Order Convictions. This is where you pick from one of six Orders Militant to coat your army in special goodness. This is the obligatory section of the book where you get to pick your exclusive abilities, stratagem, warlord trait and relic that can be chosen in addition to the Codex's generic ones. Interestingly, sanctified units, in which there are three named badass characters and outcasts, of which there is only two, do not gain access to these convictions. Before we talk a bit more about said orders though, we're going to discuss some of the more common abilities found on the units themselves. Shield of Faith, which can be found on the bulk of the army, gives the gift of a 6-up invuln save, and the ability to deny the witch with just 1d6 instead of the usual 2. But this time round they also get an auto success on an unmodified roll of 6. Sweet vanilla ice cream. 
more or less all of these same units also get some passive buffs in the form of sacred rites that follow previous codexes wherein you can pick the one you really really want or you can roll 2d6 instead ensuring you re-roll any duplicates but ultimately get the benefit of two randoms instead there's a lot of juicy shizzle in here and if approximately three quarters plus of your army are packing these then the benefits are considerable it's nice to see an appropriate level of balance in the choices you have and whether having two random really does outweigh having one of your choice when you know your opponent and the mission and if that wasn't enough, nigh on all of the units that have Shields of Faith and Sacred Rites also get Acts of Faith, aka Super Duper God Given Miracle Dice. Instead of allowing you to re-roll a good portion of the dice chucking you do, like with Command re-rolls, instead allows you to substitute dice rolls with your set aside pool of Miracle Dice. Now, if this doesn't give you reason to bling the Donald Duck out of your six-sided ornaments, then I don't know what will. You can see on screen when you get them and what you can use them for, which is to say a great deal of most things. And with you looking at getting a very minimum of one, but almost certainly more than that, especially after the first battle round, then these will give you a bit more leeway to use your command points on those juicy stratagems. Somewhat as an afterthought off the back of that wall of text, and so as to not piss off the small portion of the data sheets that don't get those bountiful gifts of the Sisterhood, is the Zealot special rule. And oh yes, it's the fairly vanilla re-rolling hit rolls for melee attacks when the unit has charged, was charged, or performed a heroic intervention. Never look a gift horse in the mouth, ladies and gentlemen. Don't even look at them, period. And so to the Order's Militant, the things that give you your little fluff and some mechanical cherries on top. We've already talked briefly about what each Order gets us, and you can multitask and use your eyes to see what each of the Orders name themselves, but just a word on the Custom Orders before we move on. Again, a common means to make your own sub-faction, whereby you get to pick two of an available 15 Minoris Convictions, at the expense of any exclusive Warlord trait, stratagem or relic. Pretty nifty if you really want to tailor an army to your playstyle needs. It also gives you the option to thematically at least create a successor chapter to one of the six default orders. But this is 100% if you absolutely positively must go full theme. As the only upside is you get to name your order. And the main downside being you don't get access to the exclusive relic. But if you're all about using existing orders, then here we go. With the martyred lady up first. Oh my, oh my, these guys are the I like my revenge serve cold order. And see them gaining miracle dice when they slay opponents' units, and also increasing their hit rolls by one when their units are under strength. The valorous heart though like a bit of punishment before they reach their ferocious best. Saving mortal wounds on a 5-up, and reducing armour penetration against them. The Bloody Rose are not fans of poncing around, and like to get it up em. Hence the extra attack and the extra armour pen on the charge, when they get charged, and if they did the heroic intervention shuffle. Just past the halfway point is the Ebon Chalice, the OG Originals, that aspire to greater purity and nobility than anyone else that cocks their bolt gun. Obtaining the ability to pick two sacred rites instead of having two randomly, and when using miracle dice during Acts of Faith, they can effectively discard two dice to guarantee a six. The Argent Shroud are the Act Now Talk Never bunch, who receive the benefit of having remained stationary if they move or advance, and when shooting or fighting, they can re roll one hit or wound roll per unit. 
which then leaves a finale of this sacred rose. The water off a duck's back, sisters, letting nothing get in the way of their steadfastness. Translating to automatically passing all combat attrition tests and gaining extra miracle dice on a 4-up during an act of faith. And then there you have your choices with the preset orders and the custom ones you can make. You can achieve a great deal of flexibility when it comes time to make your choice. As is also becoming a common theme, there are a couple of unit types that can be upgraded. Here, with Blessings of the Faithful. Either a non-named Canoness or Palatine can get the Gift of the Faith. One way to give these nondescript HQs some extra potency. Each of the six available have a passive ability that buffs the unit itself and a miraculous ability that's a one-time affair that acts like an aura, but the Codex reminds you isn't. That has an increased range depending on the combined value of miracle dice that you discard to perform said miracle. All in all, a nice way to flavour up those two units. But that there concludes most of the translation of this here Adeptus Sororitas Codex. We don't cover any of the narrative based crusade rules as that would require a whole other video. And it's not the main focus of the way most people play. On screen you can see a bunch of miscellaneous information that may or may not be of interest to you. You'll see that each of the six generic warlord traits have an associated warlord that would preclude them from picking the exclusive Orders Militant option. And if you didn't realise already, our sisters frown rather heavily on psychic powers, as you would expect. So no casting for you. They're cool with the prayers though. More than cool. You'll still see from the unit breakdowns that whilst the Codex isn't shy of HQ choices, you'll see Battle Sister squads prevalent in any Battleforged army. There's absolutely no shortage of elite choices, and just as importantly for HQ buffs, no shortage of core units in there. The rest of the battlefield roles aren't exactly swimming in choice, but if you think of where the faction has come from, there can be no real grumbles. There's choice from every angle you could possibly want to build around. That there does signal the end of the end though, we like to think you'll be in much better shape to make sense of the who's who and the what's what the first and subsequent times you open this codex. There's definitely reasons to be excited when prepping to get Adeptus Sororitas to the table. Let me know in the comments if you enjoyed the format of this new series and watch this space for the first part of our How to Build an Adeptus Sororitas Army Guide. Alas, I have been your host Benji and this video has ended.